I have to say a special hello to um, Yerushalayim and to Ramat Beit Shemesh because I never realized they were very upset that I never mentioned them but that there are a bunch of women that actually watch this year at 5.20 in the morning um, in, Ramat, in Ramat Beit Shemesh. So hello everybody in Ramat Beit Shemesh and Yerushalayim and everybody else that's listening. Baruch uh, Hashem, whoever was at the dinner, um, we made a big macha. It was packed. Uh, it much happened the last four or five days. A lot of people signed up, and I, I don't know how successful financially it was yet, but um, it was definitely f- successful, and um, it was very beautiful, and we really thank everybody who sent in donations, and specifically everyone who came. We had like 200 people five days before, and I, don't know, I think we ended up with something like 600 people, so... It was really, really very nice. We want to thank everybody. And uh, I apologize again for once again being late. It's just, it's just this time of year, there's so many simchas, and I have to go to all of them. And Mitzvah Chem, we're making my own simcha next week. So, um, thank you. So, it's a little hectic. All right. This week's Pasha is Pasha's Kairach. The, the Pasha of Machlekes. So, I'm going to dig a little bit into Pasha's Kairach. But I also happen to have been in the five towns this week, and um, I was actually invited to speak um, at a kindness, at a group like they had in City Field. Of course, it wasn't City Field, it was much smaller, but the Mashkiach from Lakewood was there, um, and that was a very big honor to speak on the same podium as him. And I'd like to talk a little bit, before we get into the Pasha, about this whole internet um, filter, this whole kindness that they had, they had here in Brooklyn, in the Aguda, it was also full. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what I said um, at this at this camp. I think it's really important. I think it's very, very connected to last week's Dvatara when I spoke about waking up in the morning, getting out of your grave, getting out of your bed, getting out of your grave and appreciating life. Mm-hmm. And um, I think this is very, very connected. So, so they've had, they had this Kinnison City Field, 60,000 people. 20,000 people somewhere else, I think it was like 80,000 people altogether, um, about putting filters on your phones, filter on your internet, filter at work. Um, they were pushing very much filters. They really didn't want to say that internet is usher because they don't feel that, that people could follow the internet as usher, and a lot of people need it for work. So I, and then we spoke about this, I asked my Rebbe if, if I should push it, and he said that whether anybody changes or doesn't change is not, is not up to us. But that you should push it and that people should go and make a machal protest. Say to Hashem, I'm not happy with the way it's going in Klai Yisrael. I'm not happy with what the, what the internet's doing to the world. Everybody should be there to, to, to make a protest. So they asked me this past Sunday to speak in, the, uh, in Lawrence, in the, um, in the five towns. So I scared them very much because Rabbi Zio spoke first. But then Rabbi Dishon spoke. Two very big tzaddikim. And then Wallerstein showed up. They so the radio. they announced me on the radio. Amen. Okay, good. So um, I'm going to Okay, good. So I got up and I said the following, and I think that this is very, very important, especially going into the summer altogether. And I said that I don't think that the problem is a filter or not a filter. I think that, that one of our problems today is that whether, no matter what we, we're trying to fix, we, we're very busy with the symptoms, but we're not really busy with the disease. And a symptom, if you fix it in one place, it pops out in another place. You, you have to fix the disease. And I, I, with all respect to Ramatisio and to everyone else that spoke in City Field, um, I don't think that they address the disease. They addressed filters, and, and of course, everyone here knows that if you want to see something on the internet that you're not supposed to, so if there's a filter on your computer, so you go on somebody else's computer that doesn't have a filter. Or you go to the library, right, which the United States of America decided that you don't have to have any filters and any kid can go to the library and watch anything that he wants. They expect the librarian to make sure that minors are not watching things that they're not supposed to, the librarian's usually so old that they can't even see past, <laughs> past the front desk, so they definitely can't see what the kid is, 
watching and she's not Jewish, the librarian, so she doesn't really care that much what you're watching. So kids know that. They're all, they, all of a sudden, kids are going to the libraries. In my day, you have to force us to go to the library. Today, <laughs> everybody has a library card. And then you got kids who go to, who go to Staples, you know, to the Staples store. No, I'm serious. You see kids there, Jewish kids, and they have computers because they sell computers. And these kids go on and um, they can go anywhere they want. So they're sitting there in Staples. You got 20 little kids on the computer. So a, kid, a person who, does, who wants to watch something nasty, filters are not going to stop them because they're not going to get around filters. They're not going to buy a phone at CVS for 20 bucks and for 3.99 get internet. If you want to do the wrong thing, there's no filter that's going to stop you. So the bottom line is, if we can figure out why you want to do the wrong thing, and we can stop you from wanting to do the wrong thing, then you're not going to need a filter. I don't have a filter. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a filter. But the reason I don't have a filter is because I don't have a computer. <laughs> so if you don't, need, you don't have a computer, you don't need a filter. I don't have a computer. I, somebody was very upset this week. I, I went to someone's house to raise money. And um, he came to the dinner. When I saw him by the dinner, so I thanked him. I thanked him very much for coming to the dinner. And he said to me, that's all you're thanking me for? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, well, what else should I thank you for? He says, you have nothing else to thank me for? I'm like, thank you for coming to the dinner. He said, you didn't get my email? So he must have sent me an email on how much money he's giving me. But I don't have email. So I said, I don't have email. He said, well, I sent the email to, to Ornava. I said, I know, but I don't, I don't, I don't get the emails. Aviv gets the emails. I just have one of these, right? It's an antique. It's worth a lot of money. It's very old. I said, I don't have a Blackberry because I don't, I don't want to be put in a situation where I'm being tested. So not because I'm an old guy, because there are guys my age that are so sophisticated and have such computer knowledge, forget about it. That, <coughs> big boys play with little toys. I mean, little boys play with little toys. Big boys play with big toys. So the older you are, it's very easy to have money, so you buy all the brand new crazy computers and crazy phones that you could get. So that's not the reason I don't have a, com a computer. The reason I don't have a computer is first of all, I deal with girls. And I don't want anyone sending a picture on, the, on if I had emails, any person could send me any picture they want. This way it goes to Aviv. Anyone sends a picture, it goes into the garbage. She doesn't bring me, she, she has my emails. She doesn't bring me nasty emails. So whatever she puts on my desk is already cleared. So pretty much I protected myself so I'm not interested in seeing these things so I don't need a filter so the question is how come Robert Wallace see what you're not normal why don't you want to see these things everybody in the world wants to see these things and you don't want to see these things what you're so religious I'm not so religious so why don't you want to see these things that's a little bit what I want to talk about why don't I want to, why, why do I want why don't I have my own in business it's terrible because I do business with big companies and they're like what's your email <laughs> I can't tell him Rebbe Wallerstein at Ornava. That's not going to fly. So I give him my brother-in-law's name and email. They're like, you don't have your own email? You're the president of the company? And I'm like, no. And they're like, shocked. So I'm going to explain to you, Manishtan. I'm, I'm not any more religious than anybody else. And I think if we get to the core of this, then we'll understand what's driving this whole generation, what's driving, what's driving this, this problem. Now the filter... <coughs> I'm not against filters because there's a Gemara. The Gemara says the following. The Gemara says if a man wants to do a sin with a woman, it's a Gemara. He should dress himself from head to toe in black and he should go to a far away city. And there he should do the sin. Not you should do the sin, but if that's what you want to do, you, that's, that's what you should do. So I remember asking a question. I, uh, none of my rabbis, my rabbis ever told me Oh, you want to do a sin? Put on your black turtleneck, your black jeans, your black shoes, get a ticket to Miami, and go do a sin. They're like, Chas Shalom, such an Avera, it's going to affect you for life. Don't you dare. Right? What Rebbe tells a kid, you want to do a sin, get dressed in black and go to Mexico. Right? So, so what's the Gemara saying? The Gemara should say, a man wants to do a sin, you're not allowed to do it. Jump into a cold ocean. I don't know. Cool yourself off. You can go dressed in black and, and go to a city and do a city. What's going on? What's the Gemara saying here? So they asked the question on the Gemara. Gemara should say, you want, don't, 
if a girl came up here and said, listen, I really want to do something wrong. Okay, dress in black and go to a faraway city. Look at me, are you crazy? Talk me out of it. That's why I came up to you. Talk me out of it. Give me a Musa schmooze. Give me a Musa safer to learn. No, dress in black and go to a faraway city. So what's the Gemara saying? The Gemara is saying something that's very practical that you need to know. Gemara is saying, what's the strength of the Eight Sahara? What's his power? So when Yaakov Avinu fought with the Malach, with the angel, so it wasn't a physical fight. Because a Malach is not, not physical. And you're not beating a Malach. He doesn't have muscles. He doesn't work out. Right? You're not beating a Malach. So the fight that Yaakov Avinu was having with the Malach was a spiritual fight. <laughs> now everybody thinks that Yaakov Avinu won. Yaakov Avinu didn't win. Yaakov Avinu only had the strength to hold the Satan down. But it seems to be that when we read this story, the way we learned it, if you go over to any kid and say, who won between the angel and Abraham and, and Isaac when they had the fight? Everybody will tell you, Jewish, not Jewish, will tell you that Jacob, not Isaac, Jacob won the fight. But he didn't win. The Malach won. The Malach, the angel, the Satan, hit him in the thigh, dislocated his thigh, and then he flew back up to Shemayim. So, ya- so Yaakov limped away, and the Malach went up to say Shira. So who won? The Malach won. Yaakov got hurt. The Malach didn't get hurt. So what did ya- why do we think that Yaakov won? Anyone here know why? What do you think? Why? He what? He got a blessing from him. Okay. That's one way of looking at it. You think he, wanted to, he, he went into this fight to get a blessing from the Satan? It's good that he got one. But he, that, that not, he didn't win the fight. How did he win the fight? Yes. Didn't his name be changed to show that he won? His throw? Absolutely. So I'm asking you. I'm saying that's where we learn it. Right, but what did he win? If we look at the fight, he didn't win. I agree with you. He called him Yasha Kale. So that's, that's the question. It means that he won, but he lost. He got hurt, and the Malach went back to Shemayim and hole. Where did he win? I'm going to tell you something amazing tonight. Yes? Um, you said it was a spiritual fight, but he got physically hurt. So that wasn't really the fight that he was fighting. So, so actually he got spiritually hurt. He got physically hurt, but he actually got spiritually hurt. What the, Malach, what the Malach did to him was, the Malach said, I can't beat you. They were fighting a whole night. It says they fought a whole night. I can't beat you, but I can beat your children. So the Medrash says, and the Zaire says, that the, the hitting him in his groin, his thigh, represented, I can't, Yaakov, you're too strong, but your children are going to fall to me. So the dislocation of his groin meant the dislocation of his children. <coughs> 2012, the, what's going on in our generation is what the Satan said. I can't get you, but I can get them in the United States in 2012. I can get them into internet, into, into Facebook, into movies, into, into, into phones on Shabbos, into, into, into marriages, into assimilation. So you I can't beat. So it was a representation when he dislocated his thigh. It was physical, but it was more spiritual. He, was, he heard him. Because he, he said, I can't get you, but I'm going to get all of us. So where's the win? So I'm going to tell you where the win is, and that answers the Gemara's question. The win is that he was able to hold the Malach down until sunrise. And the Malach at sunrise said, I have to go say, say Shira, let me go. And he said, give me a bracha, and he gave him a bracha, and he let him go. So what's the win that he held the Malach down? At the end, the Malach gave him a whack. So the win is as follows. Yaakov asked the Malach, okay, so now you're telling me that you're going to hurt my children. You can't hurt me, but you're going to hurt my children. So I need to know something from you. What is your essence? What's your power? What's your, what's your, what's your specialty? So he asked him, Mashmecha, what's your name? What does that mean? person's name is who he is. Whatever your name is in Hebrew, 
that has a lot to do with what your essence is. And that's why it says that before a child is named, when they have the mother, when they have my aunt, and there's this argument, and then at the last minute, I have a good name. And all of a sudden they agree on the name, and it happens all the time. The name is sent down from Shemayim because that's who you are. Your name is who you are. So he asked the Malach, okay, so tell me, you're going to hurt my children? Who are you? What's your essence? What's your power? <coughs> so the Malach answered him, Lama ze tishal lishmi. Why are you asking me my name? Now, Malachim don't have brains, and Malachim don't think. They're sent on a shlichus, they're sent on a, on a job, they don't process on their own. They're sent with a, like a computer chip in their brain from Hashem, this is what you have to do. They can't say, well, maybe I should do it later, maybe I should do it tomorrow. That they, don't, they don't process. So what kind of answer? Was he? And it wasn't a Jewish malach. If it was a Jewish malach, you could say, okay, Jewish malachim, they, you ask them a question, they answer with a question. Because that's what Jews do. You ask me a question, we ask you. So how, why do you need to know, right? But this malach was definitely not a Jew. He was Esau's malach. So what's this, what's this answer? What's this answer? Why are you asking me my name? Because I'm asking you your name. Tell me your name. <coughs> so we learned a long time ago that he wasn't asking him back a question. But he was answering the question. Yaakov said, what is your essence? He said, my essence is Lama Ze Tishal Shmi. My name is, why are you asking questions? Like Nike. Just do it. Don't think. No thinking process. You want to do it? You want gratification? You want to eat this? You want to make a phone call on Shabbos? Whatever that is, very. You want to watch this DVD? Whatever it is you want to do, don't think about it. His power, his essence. He told Yaakov, my essence is immediate gratification. Don't think about it. So he said, you want to know my name? Lama Zetishal. Don't ask any questions. It's party time. Just start figuring well, how this is going to affect my life. How it's going to affect my kids. It's going to affect my soul. It's going to affect my next world. Lama Zetishal, Shmi. You want to know my name? What's my essence? Don't think. So now... How did Yaakov win the fight? He held him down a whole night. He did it. There was no immediate. He tried to talk him into forgetting about Hashem. He tried to talk him into being a kafoy, to be a total denial of everything. And Yaakov Avinu had the power not to react, to hold him down a whole night. Until the Malach said, I'm not going to get you because a person who's able to put me on hold, I'm not going to get in the end. So you, I'm not going to get, but I'll get your kids. You see, because on that little computer, there's a button. <coughs> and the button is called Enter. And you can't go anywhere without pushing Enter. Because the Satan created a world, a fake world, on the internet and after 120 years when you come up to Shemayim and you're going to say yeah I went to that site and I went to that site and I wasted seven hours on the computer last night but Hashem my parents they didn't have this test they didn't have computers it's not my fault and the Satan who is the prosecutor is going to be standing right next to you, your friend. You're going to say, I didn't do anything. She pressed enter. I didn't press enter. I didn't tell her to go to that website. She sat at her computer. She pushed the button. I didn't do anything. You're right. I created, I'm the Satan. I created this terrible world. I didn't force her to push that button. I didn't force her to push the on button on her computer and then type in those letters looking for certain things and then push enter. What do I, you're right. My job was to create a fake world. I didn't tell her to go there. She entered that world on her own. So what are you going to say? What are you going to answer when you see your finger pushing enter? When you see your finger Googling or looking for the certain website that you're not supposed to be on, you're going to blame him? He didn't move your fingers. So he created this web, this net, 
where everybody gets caught, but you can't get caught. I can't get caught. I can't get caught because I don't enter his world because I don't have internet. I don't have an enter button because I don't have a computer. So he did create this crazy world. Why else did he walk into that world? In one second, I could walk into that world. Get myself a computer. I'm done. Get myself a, uh, a Blackberry. I can walk into that world. Same world that you're all in. I can walk into the same world. I just got to push enter and type a couple of letters. Today, you don't got to do much. You just Google the first two letters and it starts writing for you everything that you need to look at. So the question is why? Why don't I want to enter that world? You're all in Disneyland. You're all going into this fake world. How come Wall Street doesn't want to go into this fake world? I don't have a Yetzirah. I'm a big tzaddik. I'm not a big tzaddik. And that's the root of the disease. And if we get to the root of the disease, then we don't have a problem. So that's what the Gemara is telling us. Gemara is telling us that we learned from Yaakov Avinu that if someone has a fire in them and they want to do a sin, if on the spot you're going to tell them, you can't do it, they're going to do it anyway. So what do you tell them? You could do it. But to do it, you got to first get dressed, go for a long ride. If you're able not to react immediately, then you won't do it. And that's what Yaakov taught us by that war. He just could hold the Malach down. And the Malach said in the morning, I see I cannot beat you. How do you know you can't beat me? It's because you're able to hold me down. You're able not to react immediately. So the Gemara is saying, if we're going to tell this person, no, you can't do that Veira, you can end up in Gehenna, he's doing that Veira. He's burning. But if we tell him, you got to take this step, and then you got to take this step, and then you got to get on a wagon and a horse, and then you got to go travel to another city, and then you're a stranger in that city. So everyone's like, why is he in this city? Right? Nah, it's not worth it. Because you delayed it. So the, the filter doesn't really have a power to stop you from seeing the wrong things, because you can go anywhere you want to see the wrong things. What does the filter do? The filter gives you another step that you got to get by. I heard that by one of the Asifas, I think it was in Muncie, so they have this canine, canine filter. So they were, they, were sh they were showing off, the guys who knew how to use it, who came, so they were showing off how with a canine filter, your mamish can't go anywhere. And this kid in the crowd comes up, he says, let me show you how to break canine. And you had these can guys that were selling the canine, They're, that's what they do. And he went up to the computer, and he broke it. He went through the canine. He says, I learned how to do this a long time ago. Kids, kids have, have fantastic logic. They can get into the CIA Pentagon. You think they can't get past K-9? <laughs> but, but, if you have a filter... So one of my friends, I was in one of my friend's house the other day, so I wanted to send him from Ornava um, a, a copy of the video that we were going to play by the dinner. So I called somebody in Ornava and I said, email him a copy of what we're playing in the dinner. So they emailed it to him. And he has K9. So he tried to play it, but K9 blocks anything that's streaming. So since this video is streaming, it said, cannot play this video. So I was like, oh, I guess I'll have to wait till the dinner. He goes, no, I have the code to disengage my K9. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like, why do you have it? He says, no, you have to get the code to disengage it because because you might need it for something in business and it's being blocked and you might have to take, might be an emergency, you might have to take it off. So I'm like, so if you have the code, anytime you really want to do the wrong thing, you're just going to disengage it. He says, no, I'll tell you the truth. If I want to look at the wrong thing, I have to disengage my filter. I feel double guilty to Hashem. In other words, I have a filter and now I'm taking a step to disengage. Like, it's like jumping over a fence to steal something. If there's something in the street, right, there's $10 in the street, so you're going to pick it up. If there's $10 in someone's yard and there's a fence, you got to go climb the fence to get the 10 bucks. You're not going to climb the fence. Not because not you're going to get hurt, but it's like, it's, it's like as you're climbing the fence, you're feeling guilty. You're looking at the $10, like, what am I doing? With the $10 on the floor, you put it in your pocket right away. That's his koyach. His koyach is immediate. So the filter, it helps. It slows you down. You got to get past the filter. <coughs> but at the end of the day, it's definitely not the cure. Because you can get around it very easy. It's not the cure. So I got up there, so they were already like getting all upset because I'm coming here to talk about filters. 
And Wallstein's getting up and saying, it's not about filters. So the rabbis that hired me were like, well, why did we ask this guy to get up there? Like, <laughs> he's supposed to be talking about pushing filters. And he's saying, you know, filters are good, but they're not that good. So I said the following, and I think it's very, very important. So you have two worlds, girls. It's two worlds. You have a real world that Hashem created in six days. <coughs> and then you have a fake world, totally fake, that man made. And you have a choice in life, which one you want to live. You can't live in both. One's real, one's fake. You want to be fake, you're fake. You want to be real, you're real. You can't live in both. So the question is, why would I, as a human being, enter, push enter, the fake world if I'm living in the real world? Because I'm not happy in the real world. Either I don't have good self-esteem, or I'm going through stuff. But for whatever reason, I'm looking to escape the real world. So I could go into this fake world now that something made the fake world so fake that you can recreate yourself. You can Photoshop anyone's face on your body, or you can Photoshop anyone's body on your face. And then you could go stand in front of Maserati in the Hamptons with a big, beautiful house. And I know this 13-year-old kid who looks like, on the picture, on his Facebook page, that he's a 19-year-old Latin model. And he's got a picture of a Lamborghini in front of a huge mansion in the Hamptons. Now, I know this kid. He didn't even have 25 cents to lend me to buy a bag of potato chips. So I'm like, where did this come from? And he doesn't pay tuition in school. I'm like, this picture gets you in a lot of trouble. Because if the administrative school sees that you have a Lamborghini in front of that mansion, they didn't take full tuition. So he photoshopped everything. So he's very happy because he's this gorgeous Latin 19-year-old guy who has a Lamborghini in front of a mansion, but he's really a 13-year-old skinny little runt who lives in a teeny little house and never drove a car because he's 13 years old. He can live in this fantasy. He can create this fantasy world. And this is what the Sultan, in his brilliance, in his brilliance, created. So a person who's happy at who he is and doesn't have to Photoshop himself he doesn't have to take pictures in front of things because he's happy with who he is and he's working on what... If, if I can Photoshop and I can do all this stuff, then why do I need to earn money? Why do I need to do anything? <coughs> why do I need to grow up? If I'm 13 and everyone who's looking at my picture thinks I'm 19 and I'm getting pictures from all over the world because now everybody wants to marry me. Because I look like a model and I have a gorgeous car and I'm getting pictures from people with their names and, and send me... And you know, everyone wants to go on a shit up with this guy. <laughs> Until he shows up and he's 13 years old. And he weighs like 72 pounds, then you're going to be like, and, and he came to pick you up on his bicycle. <laughs> or, his, or his tricycle. Right? So why do, we, why do we do that? Why do we do that? And the answer is because we're not able to live in the real world. And therefore every person has to think about, Hashem created a world in six days, and he put me in that world. Why do I need to run to this fake place? <coughs> The girl had 900 friends on Facebook. And I killed them all. In one minute, in, one, in 10 seconds. I pulled the plug. And the screen went black. Like the end of the world. I thought I was back in Noah's time. I destroyed her world in a second. It's not real. Anything that you could shut off is not real. I can't shut you girls off in this room. But on a screen, I could shut you off. And on a Skype, I could shut you off. So it's not real. I can't, turn it, I can't shut anyone off in this room, make them disappear. Some of my friends, I'd love to do it, but I can't. Real friends, real people. You can't turn anything off in the real world. Do you know that? You cannot turn anything off. You can't turn a tree off. You can't turn the sun off. You can't turn the sky off. You cannot turn anything off because it is three-dimensional. It's created by God, and therefore it's there. When he's ready to get rid of it, you, get, you, get, you can't get rid of it. You can't make anything disappear unless you're a magician. And we don't, and there's no real magic. Well, I can make, I'm probably the only person in the world that can make things disappear. I have to admit it. Many times I came into a room, it was full, I started speaking, everybody disappeared. <laughs> Rabbi joke, Rabbi joke. But seriously, you cannot make a real thing. Some people on the way home will get it, they'll start laughing, it's fine. Don't worry about it. And some people tomorrow morning at breakfast will tell them, why are you laughing? But I walked and said, I said something last night, I didn't chap, I didn't chap what he said. It's very funny, but it's very, very, very sad. So, the reason I don't need to be on, on, on the internet is because I really love Hashem's real world. 
I love a leaf and I love a tree and I love a flower. I love a butterfly and I love smelling things. The internet doesn't smell, it doesn't rain on the, in the internet. If it rains, the whole computer goes kukuruku, you lose everything. Right, you can't handle water. There's no, I was sitting, I was sitting on Sunday, I was, I was preparing a Dvar Torah, I was sitting in my backyard and I was learning. And there was someone in the other backyard behind me who was sitting there on his computer the whole time while I was learning. And I was sitting there and I was just like, the wind was blowing. I was like, it's amazing. In the real world, you don't even realize that sometimes you're sitting there. Today we could have used a little more wind, right? There's wind. There's no wind on the internet. Yes, they can make a picture of leaves blowing, but there's no wind. It's a lie. The whole thing is a lie. It's not real. So if you need it for business and you need to type your term paper, your term paper, not the one that you got on the internet, the one that you wrote, right? So if you, need to, if you need to type your term paper and you need to do business on the internet, no problem. There's nothing wrong with it. But you've got to be healthy. If you're not healthy, then that enter button is going to be looking at you. Come, enter my world. I'm not telling you that you can't have internet. I can't have internet because I deal with girls and I don't want stuff coming to my, you know, I don't want people writing me stuff and sending me pictures. I'm not interested in that. So I have to protect myself. But a normal person who's healthy, who's a healthy person who likes to be in Hashem's world and has self-esteem, you can, you can do your business on the internet. You can do your work in school on the internet. At the end of the day, it's not something you can tell people. It's, it's like in the times they, there were horses telling people you can't get into a car. It's silly. It's, it's here. It's technology. I'm not telling you that you can't use technology. But if you're not healthy, you're not happy where you are, and you're not enjoying what Hashem created, then you can't go there because that other world is like, come to me, you can be whoever you want. You can watch a movie, you can sit and cry about people who are dying, but they're not. <laughs> because the same actress is in the next movie. <laughs> and now she's a superhero. Right? And people... Think about it. Think about the, the malachim watching a movie theater full of Jewish girls and Jewish women who decided they need to go to see a good crying movie. Right? We call it a good cry. And you have all these girls came back from Eretz Yisrael and all these women and they go together and it's a clean movie. It's a clean movie. It's very sad. She died from cancer. Her dog died from cancer. <laughs> then he died from cancer. Everybody in the movie died from cancer, and your mamish, they're giving out tissues and the place, crying, and never all the guys that you schlepped to see the movie, guys can't cry, so they're all laughing, because we laugh when we really want to cry, right? So the guys are laughing, the women are crying, and then, why she was, this is a sad movie. No, we have to go out to eat right now. Uh, ice cream, I need ice cream. I'm like, I'm, I'm broken, right? So all of my luck, I'm watching this, and they're like, that's what you're wasting a tear on? Do you know that a tear could break the whole Shemayim open? A tear could save anyone on the Rafur Shalema list? You know what a tear? Power of a tear in the next world? And you're crying <laughs> about an actress who right after she did the act of you know, dying, whatever it is, they said, cut! Done! Okay, she gets out. Okay, let me get my pizza. You're crying over that person. If you don't believe me, one of my proof of Tchisa Mason... One of my proofs in Anima of Tchisa Mason, if you go to a movie and the actress dies and you cry and then you stay for the next movie, the same movie when it's, 20 minutes later it starts again, she's back. <laughs> and then if you wait, watch that whole movie and you cry again and you wait another 20 minutes, because usually movies play about five times. You mamish see Tchisa Mason, the same person dies and comes back five times. <laughs> and you can go back the next day and she's back again five times. And sometimes... In a seven plex where they have seven movies, she's in, she died in this one, in this one she's flying, in this one she's a cowboy, and she's like, wow, this is amazing. She went to heaven, now she's a cowboy, and she came back. And it's like, so, so we don't think. That's the whole thing of, that's the, whole thing of the Sultan. You're not thinking. I'm telling you things like, I'm telling you, Chiddush, you go to those movies, and you read those books. And it says, fiction. It's not true. I'm telling you beforehand. The book you're about to read is not true. It's so sad. It's not true. I know, but it's so sad, Rabbi Wallenstein. It's not sad if it's not true. <laughs> Think about it for a second. If it's not true, can it be sad? No. No. My poet, you see? And if it's not true, 
it can't be happy because it never happened. It's fiction. It's not real. It's like fake flowers. Right. It's like fake flowers. They don't smell. And you don't have to water them. But at the end of the day, they're fake. <coughs> and you don't want to give, you don't want your chassan to bring you a dozen fake flowers. Because then I think you're having a fake relationship. You want them to buy real flowers. So there's no such thing as a sad movie if it's not true. You want a sad movie? No questions, Mr. Bashir. What do you think this is? What do you think this is a class? I'm gonna have to say what I have to say. How are you? What's your question? Go ahead. I'm kidding. What's your question? How could you have real emotion about something that didn't really happen? But it's not. So. What you're saying is that you are willing to give real emotions, real emotions that Hashem gave you for real things that are sad, you're willing to give those real emotions for something that doesn't even exist. That sounds even worse. That sounds worse. So you want a real movie? I'll give you an unbelievable movie to go to tomorrow. It's called Sloan Kettering Memorial in the city where there are people with real cancer. There's a guy there that I know is a good friend of mine has probably the worst cancer of any human being right now in the whole world. It's not even something that it's humanly possible to comprehend. He is suffering. He has this weird skin cancer where I don't want to go into, you can't look at him. He's being eaten up a lot. You can't even look at him. You want to cry? I can tell you afterwards. If you're really going to go visit him, I'll tell you his name and, and his room number. I'll give you the name afterwards. I don't know if he does. I can give you, I'll give you his name afterwards. You should go. He, he, he would love to have visitors. People can't walk in there. The thing is, that's too real. That's why, that's why we would watch movies. We know that but maybe if you saw him, then maybe you'd go say real to him and you cry for real. Movies are not real. It's fake. You're wasting, you're wasting what Hashem gave you. The most precious thing a human being has is emotions. You're wasting it. You're throwing it on the floor, you're wasting it for, for nothing. It doesn't, it, it's, it's not real. You're crying over something that didn't happen. So you want real? I give you plenty of real. It doesn't have to be kids with cancer. You can work with autistic kids. And you can work with Down syndrome kids. And you can work in many hospitals with not those crazy diseases, with other diseases. And you can work with very old people that, that can't get out of their beds and go to the bathroom. And you can change their bedpan. That's pretty sad. You can't go to the bathroom. Right? So a lot of girls say, I can't do that because it's real. So if you can't do that, you can't do that. But you definitely, everybody in this room that's sitting in here right now, can definitely for the last three weeks have tutored a first, second, or third grader that's struggling. There's nobody in here that doesn't have the knowledge of first grade math. Do you know how many children in the last three weeks that were having finals that was struggling and needed tutors and their parents don't have $50 an hour or $70 an hour or $90 an hour so they couldn't and they have nine children so they could not have their children tutored and these children failed and every girl in this room and every woman in this room could have given two hours last week and gone into Missouri or into any school and said um, I'm, I'm not a teacher but if you need any kids that need to, to help in reading or math, or in social studies, or Hebrew Chumash, I'll give you two hours. How are you going to answer to Hashem that, that last week, com combined in everything, you were on your phone for 19 hours, and you were on the internet for 10, you didn't help one of his children who is struggle, who's struggling in school. Why not begin services? His pre-services, his tutoring, P3s. Yeah, not everyone can get P3s. Why not? It takes a long time to get P3s, and most Yeshivas and most kids and their parents have no idea if you told them what P3 is, they think it's a parking lot in Kennedy Airport. They have no idea what it is. Why, they don't know what it is. Why did they give me an F in first grade? Why did they give you an F in first grade? Why, they them why are you asking me? Oh, why are they giving them an F in first grade? Because they failed. But that's, right. They so, right, so we're going to change the whole Chinuch world. So forget that. 
give your two, three hours to the kids. Don't give me advice. Don't come up with like, and I'm thinking personally, that's what everyone does. Well, why don't they do this? And why, well, why don't you give up three hours and teach a kid? Stop asking me questions. I'm not a mal. I'm not the malach. No, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not yelling at you. I'm saying that's, that's what we get. That's what we all react. Normally, we're like, okay, listen. I understand. But they don't know. They don't know. So you know what? So, so someone needs to go around to the schools and say, I am willing to talk to the classes about getting services. Because most people have no idea what P3 is. Now, I'm, not, I'm talking about first, second, and third graders because that nobody has an excuse. There's a lot of high school girls that are very, that are, that are very weak. And a girl, I'm sure there's a lot of intelligent girls here that go to college. You can help them with their biology region. Do you know what it means to a fourth grader that some girl shows up or some woman shows up, and even if you're retired and you're a grandmother, shows up at their door and says, hi, I'm your tutor, and the parents know that you're there for free, and you sit with that girl for two hours, and you help her pass her final. <laughs> Do you know that when she comes home with her 70, the first person she's going to call is you? Hi, Mrs. Friedman. It's Hani. Remember? Remember? You taught me last week. I got my first 70. You're going to be dancing. When she hangs up the phone, you're going to cry. You're going to take tissues, and you're going to cry for real. That's a good cry. It's a real person. Not a movie. Not a DVD. It's fake. I don't want to live in the fake world. I only have a certain amount of time. God took six days to create the most crazy world. I would love to see the whole world. I would love to go to Australia, and I would love to go to Alaska, and I would love to see the Alps, and I would love to see a Kirsch Bria. Six days, you created crazy stuff. In Flatbush, this past Shabbos, I don't know how many of you live in Flatbush, you could not walk down a block in Flatbush without thinking that you're in a perfume room. There were these trees that were flowering. They smelled amazing. Not if you have allergies, but otherwise, amazing. It was like Ganeiden. And I was on Shabbos, I was walking, and I was told my son in law were walking, they like, smell this. I don't know if you have, I don't know the halacha of the bracha. I don't know if the bracha, you have to go to the actual flower, but, or just the ear. So I was like, I don't know if we have to make a bracha. And other people, they're just walking. They never knew that it smells. They didn't look to see where the smell's coming from. They live in that fake world the whole week. We live in a crazy world. Magnificent world. I am not interested in watching a sunrise on a screensaver. <laughs> or a bunch of fish in the water, and then when I touch the screen, my fingers don't even get wet. It's fake. So you need to go into yourself. This is what I spoke about. You need to go into yourself and say, why am I running? and entering his world that isn't real. <coughs> and believe me, if you ask that question, you will know the answer. Every single person will have a different answer. We're all running away from something else. Stop running away from yourself and start running towards yourself. You might meet someone special. You. And that's why I don't need internet. I'm not, I'm not interested. I'm not interested. I'd love to see more of the real world. That's the basic problem. Disease, the disease is that I need to push that button and I need to enter that world. And once I'm in that world, I can't get out. I don't know how to get out. It doesn't have an exit button on your computer. There's no word that says exit, is there? Escape. Not exit. <laughs> You have to escape because you're a prisoner. <laughs> Look at the words. I didn't write them. Who escapes? A person who walks out on his own. Escape means you have to run away. Escape means you're a prisoner. I didn't write the computer. So you're in a net. You're in a web. You have to escape. So they're like, they're like printing it for you. They're like telling you. But something's telling you, hello? You're in a web. You're in a net. You need to escape. And you're like, eh. I entered on my own. So that's what I said. I said, filter is very important, but you need to know why. Why you need to be there for eight hours? You know what you could do in eight hours? The ladies, do you know what you could do in this world in eight hours? You know how many kids you can make smile? It's crazy. You, you, could, be, you could be a nurse. You could be, you could be a, in a hospital. Ruth is in a hospital. She could tell you what it means 
right, a volunteer in a hospital to walk into a room and bring somebody a coffee or, or they're hungry. Or, or my wife used to go to NYU. She used to, to volunteer for High Lifeline at NYU. What did she bring with her friend to NYU? What did she bring already? Chocolate danishes. Get kids with cancer. So she came to NYU with chocolate danishes every Thursday. It's not the, the end of the world. You don't know how many people we met at weddings and the, and the mother of the child that was having, who got the chocolate danish? Not the kid. The kid's not eating. The kid's not eating. The, the, the cancer patient's not really eating. Who got the danishes? The father and the grandfather and the mother who's sitting there a whole day and a whole day and a whole day and you come in with danishes and you come with a tuna fish sandwich and your mamish mechaya them. And I can't tell you how many times I went to a wedding and somebody would come over and say, that's your wife? You don't understand. When I was in NYU, she came every, every Thursday and she brought me a chocolate danish and I was always looking forward to it. I'm like, all right, chocolate danish. And you're sitting there for hours texting and on the phone and all of a sudden your life is over. And Hashem gave you this most precious thing called time. He, he let you out of your kever in the morning. He woke you up in the morning. And where are we? We're on a phone. This is dead. This is, this is a piece of garbage. This is a piece of metal. If it falls in the toilet, it's dead. You got to put it in a rice, a bed of rice, and that doesn't even work. And I know someone that this week, someone this week where it fell into water, and there's a guy in Bottle Park, he can retrieve your numbers, $250. Ransom. You want your numbers? $250. So this is, this is life. This is not life. So, so you have to realize that. If you realize that, you already took a very big step. There's, there's so much that you can do. Teach a little kid. I'm telling you, you don't, you don't understand what it means to little kids. To help them, the parents. Like, this angel walked into my house. She's an angel. I know such an angel. She walked into my house. She went to the school. She told the school, if you have any kids that you know need tutoring, I happen to be in math very brilliant. I'll tutor any kid from first to eighth grade. I'll even tutor your high school girls. So they called her up, she went to this house, and this woman, the mother, when she walked in, she said, I want you to know you're an angel. This girl has never in her life been called by her own mother, her own father, or anybody ever in school an angel. Ever. So why is she an angel? Because she decided on her own that Hashem gave me time in the real world, now I'm going to give someone else time. And I can keep talking about this. And I keep talking about it. And I spoke about it in, in Lawrence. And they all came over to me afterwards. You changed my life. And you changed the way I'm thinking. I didn't realize that, you know, what I could do in seven hours. And I've heard this so many times. And by the time you're at that door, you're looking at all your messages that you had in the last hour that Wyatt Wallstein was speaking. Because much the world is being destroyed. Iran just bombed the whole world. And you need to get those messages and to know what miklat you need to run to. Because who knows what happened in the last hour. So I'm begging everyone that's watching, and I'm begging all of you. I didn't get into Pasha's Karach. I'm really sorry about it. But I'm begging you to come back to the real world. There's so much good that you can do here. There's so much stuff that you can do here. Just, just with your time. And there's nobody in this room that cannot teach a first grader. I will not accept that. A, B, C. One plus one equals two. Everyone here knows that or even a little teeny kid to help them draw in a crayon book. You, you don't understand what's going on in this generation. You don't understand how kids are so dysfunctional and so disconnected that anybody that will walk into their life and give them a little attention at, four, at five years old, you're an angel. So it's time for us to start being an angel. And it's time for us to realize that the, the, the strength to fight the Yitzhahara is not to react immediately. I asked all these rabbis, just, I'll end with this. I said to them, I, I want to ask you a question. I asked them, this whole crowd, there were like 1,500 people there. And I asked this question, they were all like, I'm like, why, why we're making a knesia about the internet and filters? Why don't we ask her, anyone to go to ShopRite? You're not allowed to go to ShopRite. You're not allowed to go to Walmart, especially in the mountains. Why don't we ask them? So why should we ask them? There are, 5,000 non-kosher different foods in a shop, right? How come we're not worried 
my daughter's going to go to shop, right? Shopping for Shabbos, but she's not going to eat lobster, shrimp, pork, pig's feet, all this garbage that they sell in shop, right? How come none of you are going to buy any of that stuff? We don't got to buy filters. We don't have to ask for shop, right? We don't have to say you can only go to a kosher store. How come there's no problem going to a store that's full of a thousand different unkosher products, but to go into the internet that has a thousand unkosher sites, oh, filters, Walmart in the mountains in Liberty, now when people go up there, you can't even get in there, right? Well, the Hasidim, everyone's shopping there. Do you know that the first thing, when you walk into Walmart on the right-hand side, you know what's on the right-hand side? When you walk into Walmart, anyone know here? A Burger King. Burger King in Walmart. No problem? Anybody ever get up and say, don't go into Walmart, there's a Burger King. Any Jewish person ever go into that Burger King? No. Walmart sells bunch of these stick of clothing, thousands of items that aren't kosher, no problem. Why? Why not? Why aren't we looking at all the tray for stuff? Why aren't we throwing that into our cart? And the answer is, that eating treif is a moment. It affects your neshama. It doesn't destroy who you are. It's a horror. He's, he's done with that stuff. Used to be when I was growing up, Cracker Jacks, all the unkosher stuff, that was the Yitzhahara. He's done with that. That's not the Yitzhahara anymore. The Yitzhahara today is time. He wants to take, it's a battle between God, between the real world and the fake world. Where is she going to invest her time? That is the battle of this generation. That is the battle of the Mashiach, the coming of Mashiach. There are two worlds. There are parallel worlds. You can find in the fake world everything you can find in the real world. You can find fake roses and fake flowers. You can even send fake roses on the screen. You can send a dozen of fake roses. So everything is in this world. It's, it's a battle between the two for your time. Yitzhah Taif says, spend time in Hashem's world. Yitzhah says, Spend, just push enter. Come into my world. That's the battle. He's not worried about shop rights. He wants your time. Because that's your essence. That's who you are. Shop right is food. It's not your Yitzhah anymore. We don't even have a Yitzhah for that stuff. Yitzhah is for your time. And we are falling, we, me, everybody, we are falling into, whether it's the cell phone or the internet or all that stuff, we are wasting so much time. We need to stop wasting time. That's the disease. And if you correct that, the filter will help, but you're not, you're not going to even need it because you're not going to really, really want to go anywhere that you're not supposed to because I'm not interested. It's, it's not real. It's fake. It's false. It's not true. All the emotions I'm going to feel, whether it's happiness or sadness, or all it is, it's bluff. I, I, as Rabbi Wallace, I am not willing. I have seen real pain in my life. I am not willing to cry over a movie. There's no way that I'm going to waste my emotions on something that isn't true. And I'm not going to be happy from something that's fake because I have seen real simcha. I have been involved in real simcha. I have danced and screamed Shema Yisrael at the top of my lungs and my heart was so happy. I've been in, in, in by Rosh Hashim, by Yechoy, and Lag Ba'omer in a different world. In a real, real place of simcha. I'm not going to be happy by watching some stupid movie. That's not going to make me happy. It's not real. It's going to be finished. And what happens at the end of the movie? Nothing. Nothing. And the happiness, the real happiness, it's in you forever. Every time I think of that, of Lag I'm like, wow. That's what you need to work on, especially in the summer, because the summer is, is, the best movies come out in the summer. The best movies, they're called blockbusters. They bust your whole block. They're called blockbusters. Why do they put the best movies out in the summer? Because in the summer is when you have the most time. He's fighting for your time. So they wait, they hold those movies, all the best stuff. <coughs> Till the summer, now she has time. We could have one movie after another movie after another movie. You could sit a whole week and watch it. And that's, they wait. Because you know, if you put it out during the year when you're doing your work, you're doing your schoolwork, you're not going to the movies. Because you got work to do. Now, you have time. So now I want your time. So now we're going to put out all the best. It's all planned. It's all a big master plan. So now I want all your time. So you've got to be smart enough to fight it. And to start thinking on how I could use my time. There's so many nice girls in this room that could make so many people smile. Just go to a house, go to an old age home. All those old men, you're going to walk in there and say, how are you doing? 
with a big smile, you're going to like, oh, she loves me. <laughs> Chaim, I'm 95. Look, the girl said something nice to me. See? I didn't lose it. You see? <laughs> see, they still like me. He's 95 years old, right? And he's so happy. The guy hasn't smiled in 30 years. You walk in there. A nice Jewish girl came to visit me today. She said something nice to me. When I was 14, 15 years old, I started playing drums. And we decided, me playing drums, and my friend who plays piano, drums and piano never go together, ever. And then I had one more friend who played saxophone. And all three of us had just started playing. So I didn't really know how to play the drums. He didn't really know how to play saxophone. And this guy didn't really know how to play piano. We knew how to play Havana Gila. And we knew how to play by Mir Bista Shane. My Mir Bista Shane is from the 19, 1800s, right? My Mir Bista Shane, and then, right? That's all we knew how to play. So we came to this nursing home. I'll never forget it. And I was like, drums in a nursing home. Can you imagine old people? Drums, with, right? And a piano and a guy playing saxophone. It sounded like, I don't know what, right? So they, they put all these people in front of us. They wheeled them all in. I'll never forget it in Muncie. They wheeled them all in, and we're sitting there. And well, my friend, there was another friend, Oshie Langsa, he thinks he was a singer. We thought we had this whole thing going, right? He thought, he thought he was like a big singer. We also figured that they're deaf anyway, so it doesn't make a difference, right? And we got up there. I'll never forget it the first Friday. But maybe, that helped, maybe that's what ignited me to, to do what I'm doing. I, don't, I can't even say not, because we, we got up there, and they were, they, were fresh. they were like old, and some of them were like on oxygen and all that stuff. And I remember Oshie getting up and saying, so, my name is Oshie Langsam, and this is my band. And they were like... All the people were going like this, and we were like, yeah, right? And he said, okay, we're going to sing Hava Nagila. And the ladies, right, some of them are not from, it's the only Jewish song that they knew, right? The place was rocking. <laughs> rocking. They were all singing Hava Nagila. And she was going with, I remember he had a mic with a little thing, and he was like, here, he went over to the lady, he said, hey, you sing it. Me? Yeah, yeah, you sing it. It was Eilam Hava. <laughs> What, 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 what did we do? What did we do? We spent an hour, an hour and a half on our Arab Shabbos. Instead of playing basketball, we went to these old people. And once we saw what we did that week, we were like, we have to do this every week. To make someone, so easy to make someone happy? It's so easy to make somebody happy. And they thought we were good, so it was like, made us happy too. You know. <laughs> okay, there were a couple ladies in the back. You're too loud! I can't be here! You're too loud! We had that also. And the ones in the front couldn't hear anything. But Lemaisa... But my saw, it was, it was beautiful. Try it. If you don't believe me, all of you, put, put the computer down and put the cell phone down and, and go volunteer in Palm Gardens or on Avenue C. Go in there. And, I want to volunteer on Friday. Two, three girls. Go to the room where, where there's women, whatever it is, and sing for them. Your mom is, is going to be smiling. You're going to make... Older people have a right to be happy too. There's not, there's not an age where it says... Oh, you're that old, you can't be happy. You're not allowed to be happy. You have to be grumpy. No such thing. There's no such thing. Little kids, old people, kids in trouble, kids that are not in trouble. Your own family comes first, of course. There's so much that you can do with your time. Stop entering the fake world. When you go home tonight and that computer's sitting on your desk next to your bed, look at that button that says enter and say, no, not tonight. I am not entering your world. Then according to the Mephor Shem Yaakov Avinu, you held them down for that night, you're a winner. A bracha to all of you is you should have the koyach to be winners. Tzlacha. <laughs>